Hello everyone and welcome to this video, uh, part of the series on Power Apps and BPM using Flow. Um, so today we're going to have a, a quick look at the high level architecture of what makes all of these things possible. Uh, during the previous session we had a, an introduction to uh, BPM on Power Apps. If you haven't watched that, might be a good idea to do so. It's only about 8 minutes. Uh, have a quick look at that and then uh, come back to this video to, to have a look at the architecture. So what makes all of this happen is basically five components. Um, the first one is obviously the data sources. So Power Apps is stateless, so we need to store the data somewhere. And in this example, we're going to be looking at the SharePoint lists that we've used for, for the introduction demo. It doesn't really matter. It could have been on SQL. Uh, the data sources really doesn't matter that much. Second of all, we need to find a way to tell Power Apps how to behave during the various workflow steps. And uh, we've chosen Microsoft Flow for this and we're storing a JSON BPM profile in Flow um, that basically tells Power Apps what to do during the various steps. Then we've got a custom connector and that allows us to retrieve the JSON from Flow in JSON format and then read the information in Power Apps. Fourth component is Microsoft Flow again. And this basically takes care of every time that the user clicks on submit, um, this Microsoft Flow will actually go and execute the, the triggers as well as go and determine what is the relevant next step in the business process as well as who the responsible people for that step is. Lastly, we'll then have a look at the formulas that are used in Power Apps to basically show and hide and lock and unlock fields and objects based on the, the business profile in Flow. So first up, let's have a look at the data sources. And there's really not a, a lot of magic here. All that this does is store the data for the application. And we split the data sources into two. The first one is the source or the list, in this case, SharePoint list, that stores the data. And therefore, we only store data. We don't store any workflow or process-related data into this list. Uh, this is only used to keep track of the data in the application. The second list is what we use for workflow history. And it actually uses, um, or we use it for more than just history. Actually what happens is as soon as the user clicks on submit, Power Apps would write an entry into this list to state what the process key is, what the submission date, the record ID, the data record ID, the person who is executing this action, the process stage, and what step they're executing from, and which option they have selected at the time of submitting this. So up to the selected option column is submitted by Power Apps, and that then actually triggers Flow to do its bit in determining what is the next workflow step, um, who is the next person in line for the relevant role, and all of these sort of goodies. So the workflow history is actually where a lot of the, the magic happens. And uh, this is an also a very handy table for reporting purposes because you can now, over all of your processes, go and see how long does the various workflow steps take. So uh, we will be spending quite a bit of time in, in this data source at a later stage. Next up is the very handy HTTP request and response function in Flow. And we basically use this to act as the profiling mechanism. So in this uh, HTTP response, we can go and specify the JSON that will tell Power Apps how to behave during the various workflow steps. So we'll be delving into, into the JSON um, in a later video. But essentially, this is the information that tells Power Apps which fields or which objects should be visible or editable during the various workflow steps. Um, again, if you architect this properly, you can reuse this flow for multiple processes. So you'll see in this example, um, when this flow is called, it's going to be passed a process key, and that process key is then used in the switch statement to determine which process profile to return to Power Apps. So it makes a lot of sense to centralize these things to avoid having multiple custom connectors and multiple flows running all over the show, basically doing the same thing. So after profiling your business process in flow, 
we now need a way to get that information into Pi Apps and uh, only recently did Flow and Pi Apps start supporting the functionality to return information to Pi Apps from Flow uh, but we haven't yet done the JSON in that format and we're not sure if that works uh, we haven't tested that yet but basically what we have been using up to now is a custom connector and uh, you'll see that there are two custom connectors on the screen don't worry about the first one um, that's the one for agility that we use to connect to the third party business process management engine while the second one is what we use to connect to flow in order to extract the information so again if you profile multiple business processes in flow you can use one custom connector to connect to that one flow in order to retrieve multiple business processes so you don't have to do custom connector for each business process which is a good thing because setting up a custom connect connector can become tricky and I'd suggest that you don't do that while there are small kids in the vicinity they might get to see a part of you that you don't want them to see so if we go into the custom connector you'll see that there's only one one root or one endpoint and that basically uh, does a request to flow and we pass it a few parameters as well as the process key in the body and that's then going to tell flow which process we're looking to return and then in return uh, we'll get all of the various attributes from the JSON profile and this is then what tells Pi Apps how to behave as we mentioned earlier, as soon as the user clicks on submit, uh, Pi Apps writes an entry into the workflow history. Flow then picks up that that submission took place and then triggers the submit flow that executes the actions as well as determines what is the relevant next workflow step, what is the uh, next person in line and so on and so forth. So if we have a look at this flow, it's uh, actually quite interesting in, in how it works. First of all, it is this particular flow is triggered from a SharePoint list as soon as an item is created. This in initiates a few variables. It connects to the data record because there might be information in the data record that we need as well. And then um, it also connects to that same custom connector in order to get the JSON profile uh, from flow in order to understand more around the business process. Um, and it'll then read things like the step names, the step roles, these sort of these sort of things from JSON. There's a switch statement that then processes the relevant step and options to determine what the next step should be. Um, from here, we go and fetch that step in the JSON profile, and again initiate a few variables, and then determine what the who the next responsible person is based on the roles. And then finally updating the workflow issue with that information and then sending off email notifications and, and so forth. So again, if you structure this properly, you can actually use the same flow for multiple business processes because all of the process related information is stored in JSON um, and the rest can be configured in such a way that this one flow can accommodate the different processes. Next, we'll have a look at the, the various formulas in Pi Apps that actually make Pi Apps behave in the way that it does for the various workflow steps. So things like on start, we need to fetch the JSON profile from, from flow and uh, you'll see that we're passing it the process key. Um, we're setting a variable over there and we're actually passing that to the custom connector and then we're writing that feedback into a collection and then creating another collection to keep track of the various steps in the process. And that's then basically what we use throughout the process in order to determine what the form should look like. If we go and create a new record, you'll see that on all of the various fields and, uh, and objects, there are formulas to make it adhere to those JSON profile that's now stored in the collections. So if we have a look at the, on, or the visible property, you'll see there's a formula that calculates whether the, the specific uh, field or control should be visible or not. And um, this is a generic formula, so we've got Excel spreadsheets that automatically generate this for you. So it's easy to go and copy and paste this into the various controls, and then the controls will behave according to the business process. So next we'll have a look at the submit button. and. Uh, over here we do a few validations to make sure that 
uh, fields are populated. Unfortunately, we haven't found a way to specify this in a profile as well. So you can either specify in formulas or you can actually create the rules in Pi Apps and test against those rules. But we'll go through this in detail um, on how to, to do this. We've got a patch command over here that basically updates the workflow history and that'll then uh, trigger the flow to trigger the submission of, of the specific process. So we'll, we'll go into this in, in a lot more detail as well. So that concludes our video today and the technical overview. Please join us in the next video where we'll start discussing in more detail the JSON profiling methods that we're using for Flow and uh, we'll show exactly how that works. And uh, we're looking forward to seeing you again. Please let us know if you have any questions or suggestions. My contact details are currently on the screen. So we're looking forward to hearing from you. Have a good day. Bye-bye.